Well, some of us in this room have already talked about this, but for those of y'all who are watching on YouTube, I felt like I needed to make an announcement because our very own Maverick over here got baptized today. And um, it was very exciting for us. He did that at the uh, our morning service today at church. And so um, I just figured I would announce that because I'm very excited for him. I know all of us are excited for him, and I felt like that was something that should be documented. And so now it is. That being said... Let's hop into the end of Exodus. Uh, we're going to cover over half of the book today because we covered under half the book last week. Uh, we are doing a recap of the um, whole Bible, and we are slowly but surely beginning to pick up the pace. Uh, we spent several weeks in the book of Genesis. We are spending two weeks in Exodus, the first week being last week, the second week being today, uh, and then we are going to just begin trucking our way along as we slowly pick up the pace, uh, and then there'll be a some places where we slow down, and then some places where we pick back up and stuff. Uh, but, Lord willing, we are going all the way to Revelation, so that by the end, you'll have a better grasp of the whole thing. Can somebody recap for us what happened in Exodus chapters 1 through 15 last week? Um, to be fair, I don't think everybody was here, but for those of y'all who were. People of Israel... Um have lived in uh, Egypt for quite some time, and uh, the, there's one difference between uh, the time that they had Joseph there, and then uh, when a new pharaoh came, uh, this pharaoh starts oppressing the people of Israel because uh, he doesn't like that they're multiplying in the land, and then um, Moses is born, uh, he gets spared from uh, Pharaoh's killing of uh, the baby boys, and then uh, after that, um, he you know a lot of time passes. He goes out out into the wilderness, and um, eventually he uh, gets called by God to go and save his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we ultimately, basically, long story short, uh, the people of Israel are enslaved, and Moses is sent to go and save them. Right? And so we really saw that whole thing unfold in Exodus chapters 1-15, through 15, uh, culminating in basically a series of ten plagues that fell upon the people of Egypt, uh, and then ultimately in the institution of this feast called Passover, uh, which then resulted in the final plague uh, and the people of Israel being freed. Uh, and then where we left off last week was actually with them passing through the Red Sea, uh, what, which actually in Hebrew it's actually the Sea of Reeds. Right? They passed through the Sea of Reeds, and they were delivered into the wilderness. Right, uh, very, Stuff that you're pretty familiar with, usually because uh, even those who aren't necessarily as involved with church have probably heard this story once or twice. Maybe they've seen the movie The Ten Commandments back with what? Was that Charlton Heston? Um, <laughs> yes. Or um, you know, maybe they've seen Prince of Egypt, or maybe they've seen Ridley Scott's Exodus, Gods and Kings. Mm -hmm. um, if so, that's unfortunate for them. Um, <laughs> but people are usually familiar with the story. Right? Now we begin to get into territory that people are a little bit less familiar with, and that's okay, because we're going to be more familiar with it by the time we get to the end of today. Uh, and so we're actually going to pick up, not in Exodus 16, but the very end of Exodus 15, uh, because um, this is one of those places where the chapter division doesn't really, um, it doesn't really work to our favor. Right? Uh, if you remember, um, the way that I like to structure the book of Exodus, or the way that I view it, structured is really that there's two parts, right? And it all goes back to what Moses said to Pharaoh um, whenever he was asking for the people to be let go. Do you remember what Moses said to Pharaoh on behalf of God? Let my people go so that they may serve me in the wilderness. Yes. Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. That that phrase repeated almost seven times in the um, in those opening chapters. Right? It's, I say almost because it's repeated several times, but there's sometimes where it's slightly varied. And if you know that phrase, you'll know the structure of the book of Exodus. Right? Because chapters 1 through 15 largely are the let my people go section where God is getting them out of Egypt. And then chapters 16 through 40 are more or less the serving God in the wilderness and figuring out how to do that section. And so that's where we're at currently. But that really begins at the end of chapter 15. Let's look what it says. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. 
Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. All right. So right off the bat there, we basically see something that is going to set the groundwork for the next few chapters. Uh, what we see is that the people begin to do what? They start to grumble. They start to grumble. How many days does it take them to begin grumbling? Not even one day. Three no, days. Three days. Three days. Oh, it takes okay. them three days. Oh. Yes. Uh, they get through the Red Sea, and if you remember, chapter 15, the beginning of it, was them singing this amazing praise song. Right? I mean, the way that chapter 15 ends is one of the, it's just a great moment where the people of Israel realize who their God is. And we talked about how the whole goal of the Exodus was for God to basically flex, right? He's basically showing the people of Israel who he is and what he can do for them. And when you get to chapter 15, they sing this amazing song, and you're like, wow, they get it, right? They're saying there is no God like our God. The people of Philistia are trembling. The people of Edom are trembling. The people of Moab are trembling. The people of Canaan are trembling, right? They realize that Yahweh is the God of all creation, and they praise him for it. Three days later, they begin to grumble. Uh, this shows us something very sick about the human heart. It is that our gratitude is very fleeting, and our longing for sin is very demanding of us, right? And very quickly, we will abandon faithfulness and turn to sin, uh, and I wish I could tell you this is the only time it's going to happen, but it's not, right? It takes three days for them in the wilderness, and they begin to complain. It's easy for us to look down on them here, and it's easy for us to be like, wow, those stupid people. Wow, how could they complain against God after all he's done for them? But we do the same thing, right? I mean, if we were wandering in the wilderness and the desert for three days and we were thirsty, we would probably complain as well. And we'd be like, how is this any better than Egypt, right? We'd probably ask the same questions. Uh, and even in our own lives, God has done so much for us. He has given us his son to die for us. Yet still we turn against him every single day, right? This is just who we are. Uh, that doesn't make it all right. It's just a matter of human nature, right? And so uh, what we have here is that they complain and God provides, right? They say that they're thirsty, God provides them water. And so if you keep reading, it says, there he made them a statute and a regulation and there he tested them. So we see that God is testing the people here. Ultimately, they're failing the test, right? And they're going to fail the test again and again and again. And unfortunately, today we're going to see a bunch of those failures very quickly. Uh, and he said, if you will give me earnest, give earnest heed to, my vo to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, Yahweh, am your healer. Right? So God makes a promise and he says, as long as you follow me, I will take care of you. Whenever you get to chapter 16, the people complain even more, right? Um, they continue traveling further into the wilderness, and now they're no longer complaining about water. What do you think they're going to complain about? Food. They want food, right? Ah, oh, we want food. What are we going to do? And so uh, the sons of Israel, this is verse 3, they said to um, their leaders, Would that we had died by Yahweh's hand in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the fool, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Right? So not only are they complaining about water, now they're complaining about food, and not only are they grumbling about it, they're actually accusing God of wanting to kill them. Right? So it's getting even worse. Right? As they go further into the wilderness, they are being tested, but they are failing. Contrast this by Jesus, who will go into the wilderness to be tested but he's going to succeed, right? So whenever Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he is going to pass with flying colors. And ironically, what he's going to be doing is he's going to quote scriptures that come from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, those scriptures that Moses gives them is recapping their failures in the wilderness, right? And so Jesus is going to succeed where Israel fails. But right here, Israel cries out and says, what did God, like what was God thinking? He brought us in the wilderness to kill us. And so God says, okay, you want food? I'll give you food. I'm going to rain bread down from heaven. And I'm going to give you food to eat so that you'll be satisfied. And I'll give you food day after day after day. However, he gives them two requirements. 
right? Uh, well, there's really not necessarily two requirements. There's two tests that he gives them, and they're going to fail both of them, right? The first test is that he says you are not allowed to gather more than any given day's provision, right? Uh, in this one, it seems like he's trying to teach them self-control, yep. right? He's trying to teach them to moderate themselves and to not just overindulge, right? So what's going to happen is that they're going to wake up each morning, and there's going to be this dew-like substance that hardens into bread that they find on the ground. This is going to be called manna, right? The word manna literally means, what is it, right? Uh, they literally looked at it. They didn't know what it was, and so they named it, what is it, manna? Uh, and so God's going to give them this manna, and every day, uh, every family member, like they're supposed to get go out, and they're supposed to gather the manna together just enough for that day's provision. If they get extra manna, then it's going to go bad, right? That's what God tells them. What do you think they do? They grab extra manna, right? We get to see that these people, they don't understand moderation. They don't understand self-control. Instead, even whenever God miraculously provides for them, they overindulge themselves. And they try to uh, really just take more for themselves, right? This is also bad because if you are overindulging yourself, what are you doing to your fellow man? You're depriving them. Up. You're depriving them, yeah, you're... right? And so what he's trying to teach them is he's trying to teach them a communal mindset, right? Take care of your fellow man. They're not doing it, though. Right? They are focused on themselves and only themselves, and so the food goes bad. Right? That's test number one with the manna. They fail that. He does another thing. Right? He tells them that on the sixth day of the week, they should gather twice as much manna, because on the seventh day is what day? The Sabbath. It's the Sabbath day. Right? And so on the Sabbath day, they're not supposed to grab any manna because it's the day of rest. Right? So he's teaching them to trust in his provision. Right? But what do you think they do come the seventh day? Eat the manna? Well, no, they get up to go look for some manna, right? Uh, so they, like, they, they obey him, and they gather twice as much on the sixth day, and they should be satisfied with that. But instead, even on the seventh day, they get up, and they go out there looking for some more, right? It's almost like they were trying to swindle God out of some extra manna, right? It's like they're like, ah, let's see if we can trick God into giving us some more bread. Uh, it's not too dissimilar from whenever Jesus feeds the 5,000. You remember that story? Yep. In the New Testament, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And whenever he leaves, remember they all follow him. This is in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. They all follow him over, like across the water. And they confront him, and he tells them, you only followed me because you wanted more bread. right? You weren't following me for me. You weren't following me because of my provision for you. You were following me because you wanted me to provide you with more free meals. right? Very similar to what the Israelites are doing here. Right? The Israelites, um, they're not submitting to God, they're using him. Right? Ooh, God's going to give us extra food, let's take more. Right? And so they fail in regards to the Sabbath test as well. Yes, sir? It's like they're uh, valuing the gift rather than the giver. Well, that's that. exactly what they're doing, yes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into that even more as we um, move a little bit later on in the story. Uh, in chapter 17, they're going to complain about water yes, yet again. Let's look at what it says. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel sojourned, uh, journeyed by stages from the wilderness of Sin, according to the command of Yahweh, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? But the people thirsted there for water. And they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to Yahweh, saying, What shall I do for this people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand with your, uh, your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you will strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Masa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh among us or not? So once again, do you see what they're doing? Right? They, like, Yahweh is testing them and they are testing Yahweh. Right? But the thing is, it makes sense for Yahweh to test them because they haven't been tested yet. Right? Um, he needs to see whether or not they've got it in themselves to be faithful. It doesn't make sense for them to test Yahweh because what has Yahweh already demonstrated to them? 
he's he's already, faithful. Well, he's demonstrated that he's faithful and that he's with them, right? I mean, they were slaves less than a year earlier. They were slaves less than a few months earlier, right? This is very fresh on their minds. They were slaves for hundreds of years, right? And now, here they are, miraculously delivered from bondage with a strong hand and outstretched arm, and now they're testing God. Is Yahweh amongst us or not? What do you mean, is Yahweh amongst you or not? Did you not walk through parted waters? Did you not see the firstborn of Egypt, like, struck down? What do you mean, is Yahweh amongst us? Right? But this is also very similar to what we're going to see again with Jesus. I'm going to highlight the Jesus parallels because um, this is like the gospel authors are trying to highlight this as well. Right? So Jesus, people are going to come up to him. Uh, honestly, it's actually exactly what happens at the feeding of 5,000. Right? Afterwards, they come up to him and they say, give us a sign to show that you are who you claim to be. And he says, you're asking for a sign because you want more bread. Right? And so he rebukes them because he's like, I've already proven to you that I am who I claim to be. Right? In other places, people ask Jesus for a sign, and he says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. No sign will be given you except for the prophet jo like the sign of the prophet Jonah. Right? And so we have the same thing here. Um, whenever Jesus is being tested in the wilderness, you remember that um, the devil will tell him, if you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from the temple, and you know God will send his angels to catch you. And Jesus responds and says, you shall not put Yahweh your God to the test. Right? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, because Jesus doesn't need to prove that God is with him. That's what the devil's trying to do. Right? The devil's trying to ask him, is God really amongst you? Jesus says, I already know that he's with me. Right? I don't need to test him. But that's what the Israelites are doing. That's not very good. Right? And so already, just in the end of chapter 15 through chapter 16 and the beginning of chapter 17, We've seen that Israel has failed again and again and again. They're being tested and things are not looking too hot. Then, chapter 17, verse 8, we see a development uh, in what's going to happen here with Israel. Let's look at what we read. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Right? So if you're picturing a map of Israel, right? If you go like, like the promised land, right? Israel. If you're looking at that map and you go directly south, um, you get to the land known as Amalek, right? These are where the Amalekites live. Well, the Amalekites have heard that Israel is wandering in the wilderness, so they're going to go down there and they're going to fight them. Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us to go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will, stand, uh, I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Uh, do you remember why Moses, um, or why God told Moses not to lead the people of Israel um, across the land into the promised land? They weren't ready to fight the Philistines. Yes, they, they back and go to Egypt. exactly. They were not ready to fight the Philistines, right? The Philistines were mighty warriors. The Israelites were not ready to fight them. And so what did God have them do instead? Go through uh, part of waters. They went through the Red Sea, and what was God demonstrating there? They were showing that he's uh, with them. He was demonstrating that he's with them and that he is powerful enough to take down an army by himself, right? And so, as Amalek now comes down to fight Israel, Moses communicates to Joshua, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go stand on a mountain where everybody can see me and I'll have God's staff in my hands, right? Remember, this is the same staff that parted the Red Sea, right? Uh, and so, he's basically, you can follow Moses' logic, right? These people know that God can take down an army, right? And, they don't, and God doesn't need them to fight, Right? And so what the people are going to do is they're going to look at Moses. And as long as they see the staff of God raised up, their confidence will be boosted and God will miraculously provide for them. Right? And so that's what we're going to see happen. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Right? So I think that this is probably a mixture of something miraculous and also um, just the people's confidence. Right? Because whenever they see the staff of God raised up, they're reminded of what God did at the Red Sea. Right? And whenever the staff of God goes down, it, it's almost like a sign that God's not with them or something like that. Right? Even though I think that actually God, we actually do have a miraculous thing happening behind the scenes as well to where by Moses' uplifted arm, God is helping them succeed in the battle. Right? But remember, uh, well, this isn't really established quite yet. It will be established in a few chapters. 
But their success in battle and stuff like that is going to hinge on their faithfulness to God. Right? And so I think that what we see in this story is we see that correlation being made. Right? Whenever your eyes are uplifted and looking to God, you will prevail. Whenever it's down, you will not. Right? I think that's what's being communicated. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then he took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. If you remember back whenever we were doing our early units of the apologetic series, um, you remember whenever we were talking about internal evidence for the canon of Scripture? You remember that? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, this is the very first reference to anything being written down in Scripture. Right? God turns to Moses and says, write this down in a book. I will utterly blot out Amalek. What does God mean by that? I don't want Amalek, uh, like I want to wipe Amalek off the face of the earth because, you know, they're, they're doing horrible things. You know, yeah. Funny. Yeah, so Amalek, they go down in history as the very first people to directly oppose Israel once Israel gets out of bondage. If you remember back in Genesis... God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and those who do not, I will curse. If you are raising up a sword to fight against Israel, are you blessing them or cursing them? Cursing. Cursing them, right? And God said, if anybody dishonors you, I will curse them. Well, these people are trying to destroy Israel, so God says, I'm going to blot them out. Uh, our friend Mike Stratton, he's got a shirt that says Amalek in Hebrew, and there's a line crossed through it. It's really funny. Not many people get the joke, but I think it's very funny. Um, this is why it's going to be such a big issue later on whenever we see King Saul, right? Remember, King Saul is sent to wipe out the Amalekites, yet he lets um, the king and some of the animals live, right? And that what, that's what gives rise to the, um, the phrase that we have on Maverick shirt right there, to hear is better than to sacrifice, right? Saul's whole issue is that he was told to wipe out Amalek, and he did not. Right, uh, and so that's all going, and that's going to pave the way for even the Book of Esther, right? The Book of Esther, you are still seeing the Amalekites causing Israel trouble, right? Uh, and that's literally like the last chronological book that we have really in the Old Testament. Uh, and so Amalek's going to be this continuous thorn in Israel's side, and it's because Israel is not going to wipe them out as they're supposed to. Uh, but God does promise, I will wipe out Amalek, and so Moses built an altar and named it Yahweh is my banner, and he said. Yahweh has sworn Yahweh will have war against Amalek from generation to generation, right? So the Amal Amalekites go down in Israel's history as really the first big bad guys, other than, I guess, Egypt, right? Egypt is a bad guy, and now the Amalekites, also very, very bad. What do we see being established here uh, when it comes to the nation of Israel in that story? The one with uh, them in the wilderness? Or? Well, in the, the, the Amalekites. What is established there for the first time? From a governmental perspective. Because remember, this is, they're going to become a nation. That, uh, may I guess that it... Uh, what did they just fight? Um, fighting the Amalekites. They just fought a battle. So what was just established? An army, an army, right? An army was established, right? Here we like because remember, like they have not like these people have been slaves, right? They don't know how to fight a battle, right? But here we have the very first army of Israel being established, right? The main reason I'm highlighting that is because as we get slowly and surely closer to Mount Sinai, which is going to happen in chapter 19, we are seeing Israel gain its structure, right? So they were slaves, but remember, whenever they went into Egypt, they weren't a nation yet, right? There were 70 people. Right? They were just a big family. Well, now here they are, thousands and thousands and thousands. They have become a nation, but they've been a nation of slaves. Right? They didn't have any structure. Right? But now, here they are in the wilderness, and very quickly, structure is being established. Right? So now we have the very first army being established, and chapter 18 is about the very first government being established. And how that goes down is this. Right? They arrive in the land of Midian, right? which tells you that they're right next to Mount Sinai, because remember... 
Um, Midian is the place where Moses fled to whenever he left Egypt the first time, and that's where he encountered God at Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb. And so they go to the land of Midian, and lo and behold, who comes to visit him, uh, who comes to visit them, but Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, right? Jethro comes, uh, and that had to be an amazing sight, right? Just think about that, right? Imagine that your 80-year-old son-in-law comes up to you one day and says, hey, I was walking the sheep, one, I was walking the sheep earlier, and God showed up to me in a flaming bush and told me I'm going to go take on the most powerful man in the entire world and have him free up thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of his slaves. You would probably think that your son-in-law is pretty crazy, right? You'd probably think that your son-in-law had smoked some cactus or something out in the wilderness <laughs> and that he was delusional, right? But here we are just a few months later and Moses comes back accompanied by thousands of people, right? I mean, that had to be an amazing sight. And Jethro goes to see what Moses is doing, and he sees that his son-in-law is in way over his head, right? Because what happens is this. Moses sits there from dawn until dusk, answering everybody's problems, right? And we know these people can grumble, right? The first thing they did when they got into the wilderness was start grumbling. Well, now here's a long line of people Constantly coming before Moses, asking for help, asking for help, asking for help. Solve this problem, solve that problem, solve this problem, solve that problem, right? We've already seen how much they grumble as a whole congregation of people because of problems that everybody's facing. Well, now think about all the different problems that they could be arguing about, just like, you know, one person versus another, right? So from dawn till dusk, people are bringing their problems to Moses, and Jethro sees this. And Jethro, at the end of the day, he pulls Moses aside and says, Moses... This is too heavy a burden for you to carry alone, right? You can't do this, man. What you need to do is you need to appoint, um, you, you need to appoint leaders, right? You need to put people in charge of thousands, in charge of hundreds, in charge of fifties, and even in charge of tens, right? So you're creating a delegation system, right? So there's going to be one commander in charge of ten people, and that person will answer to the person who's in charge of fifty, and that person will answer to the person in charge of hundreds, and that person will answer to the person in charge of thousands. Right? So you're creating this like hierarchical structure so that not everything has to go through Moses. Right? If it's a small problem, well, there's the, you know, the the person at the bottom of the branch, he can handle that. Right? And then Moses only has to handle the main issues. Right? This will allow Moses to actually be more successful at his job and allow him to get some rest. Right? To where he doesn't have the weight of an entire nation on his own shoulders. Right? And, And so Jethro highlights this. And I think it's actually kind of cool um, because this kind of highlights that um, in many ways um, the function of a king is a it's a near impossible task, right? Um, because men were not intended to be elevated to such a lofty status to where people almost idolize them, right? And Moses is not their king, but they're kind of going to it, Moses as their king, right? Because he's their de facto leader. Right? He is the prophet who delivered them from Egypt. And so they're going to Moses in many ways as a king, and it's too much for him to bear. Right? He cannot handle it. And that's what Jethro's highlighting. And so Jethro says, hey, it's like basically it's almost like this job is something that only God himself can carry alone. And so what you need to do is you need to make sure you've got other people to help you out. Right? And so you need to have a governmental system. Right? You need to have um, different offices that are established in order for you to actually be able to do this. Uh, and so what we have as a result of this story is we have the very first government for official being, uh, the government for Israel being established, mm-hmm. right? And so when you look at the end of chapter 17 and all of chapter 18, you have Israel's army and you have Israel's government being established. Well, that's really cool. But do you know what every good government needs? What does the government need to keep people in check? Uh, law enforcement? Well, they need a law. Yeah. Right? Um, they need some sort of law for which people are going to follow. Well, that gets us to chapter 19. Chapter 19 is where the people arrive at Mount Sinai. And if you remember, whenever Moses went before Pharaoh, he said, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Well, they're in the wilderness. And if you go back even further, whenever uh, God was talking to Moses at the burning bush, do you remember what he said would be the sign to Moses that he was with him? This will be the sign to you. If you will deliver the people and bring them to this 
mountain? Yes. He says, the sign to you will be that once you have freed the people, you will bring them back to this mountain. And so that's where Moses has been taking them, right? He has been taking them back to Mount Sinai. Chapter 19 is where they arrive. Question about that. Uh, back when he was, when he first was at the mountain, why, why doesn't uh, they, excuse me, I'm going to have myself, why didn't they not say Sinai back then? Why didn't they say Horeb back then? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, that yeah, I, I don't fully know that. Uh, you'll also notice that for some reason, like Jethro was called Ruel uh, in previous chapters as well. Um, it just seems like there's just different names for them to call things. Kind of like you know, I can call you Benjamin. I can also call, also call you Buddy. I can call, you know like this. Yeah. Like sometimes we just do that. Um, I'm sure there might be some scholars who have better answers than that. Um, but you just kind of pick up on the fact that um, they are referencing the same thing. Yeah. So. Um, chapter 19, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession amongst the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. This is what I like to call God's proposal. And when I say proposal, I mean it in the sense of marriage. Right? This is where God says, here's what I've been planning all along. Right? Now that they arrive at Mount Sinai, he says, okay, now that you're here, you've seen all the stuff that I've done for you. You've seen all the stuff that I can do for you. You've seen how I am the God of all creation. But you've also seen how I want to make you my people. And so, if you hear me, and if you submit to me, I will make you mine, though all the world and all heaven itself cannot contain me. This is a proposal, right? He's saying, I will be yours, you will be mine. He's saying, I can pick anybody, but I pick you. And he says, that's what this whole thing was about, right? Why did I send all those plagues? Why did I part the waters? Because I wanted to show you what I could do for you, right? This is like a man proposing to a girl, and he just did the most elaborate proposal ever. He says, yeah. Like, this is the moment, right? It's like one of those, like, you've probably seen those videos on YouTube where it's like the most elaborate proposal ever, uh, and then it finally culminates with, like, the girl showing up and the guy standing there on a beach surrounded by candlelight. And he begins to give the speech where he says, yes, this is all for you because I want to spend my life with you. That's kind of what's happening in chapter 19, right? So what God communicates, he says, I am going to come down, and I'm going to appear to y'all, and I'm going to give you my law, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to agree to it. And this relationship will truly begin. And so, um, verse 7, Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. Yahweh said to Moses, behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to, or, uh, of the people to Yahweh. Right? So God says, all right, if the people are willing to do this, then I'm going to come down. I'm going to make myself known. And if you've been reading since the beginning of Genesis, this is an exciting moment. Because when is the last moment that, I mean, we've seen that like, you know, God will show up and talk to people. Right? I mean, we saw God walking and talking with Abraham. We saw God showing up and talking to Cain. Right? But it was always kind of understood that whenever God was showing up in those instances, he was almost taking on like human form. That's not what's happening here. Right? This is Yahweh himself descending amongst the people. When is the last time we've really seen Yahweh like that? In the garden. Garden of Eden. Right? When Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord their God walking in the garden. Right? And Yahweh confronted them. Right? That's the last time we've really seen Yahweh in this sense. 
And this is ultimately where the end of the book of Exodus is heading to, right? It is where God is going to come and dwell amongst the people. But before then, God's going to come and dwell on top of the mountain, right? And so that is what he is predicting right here. And he says, Moses, if the people are okay with it, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to introduce myself to them, right? This is the groom introducing himself to his bride. Yahweh also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall, sh- uh, no sh- no hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So um, God says, all right, I'm going to show up and I'm going to descend. But whenever I get there, make sure the people are standing far away. And they're not allowed to approach until they hear the sound of the trumpet. Um, This imagery is actually really cool. Um, Here we see that Yahweh is the one who rides the clouds and there's a trumpet blast accompanying him. Uh, When you get to the book of Revelation, you see Jesus riding on the clouds accompanied by the blast blast of a trumpet. But it's called the final trumpet, right? So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman, right? So they are called to totally sanctify themselves, right? Even married couples aren't allowed to commit acts of marriage, right? They're not, like, they are literally just to be totally clean of everything. So it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there was thunder and lightning and flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Right? This is a cool moment. Right? All the people of Israel are gathered here for God's revelation. Right? I mean, their groom is coming to introduce himself. Right? It's almost a reversal of the Garden of Eden. Right? Remember whenever Adam was put to uh, put to sleep? And whenever he woke up, Eve was there presented to him, right? His bride was presented. Well, now it is the bride that is getting ready to meet their groom, right? They have seen the things he can do, but now they're going to see who he actually is. And there's thunder and light. I mean, this is like a really cool, like it's like lightning. It's like a, it's like a Broadway production, right? There's like lightning, fire, all this stuff going on. And here Israel is gathered at the foot of the mountain waiting for God to arrive. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Right? So Yahweh himself isn't the cloud. Yahweh descends in the cloud, right? That's cool. Once again, Yahweh is the one who rides the clouds. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, go down and warn the people so that they do not break through to Yahweh to gaze and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to Yahweh consecrate themselves or else Yahweh will break out against them. Moses said to Yahweh, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you warned us saying set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then Yahweh said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Right? So basically we got this deal going on. Right? Where God is hoping... Like, it seems like the what God is setting up here is ideally he's wanting all of them to eventually be able to draw near. But Moses realizes that they're not all ready for this. Right? He says, You're going to break out against them, like you said. And God says, That's fair. So just go get Aaron and bring them up here, and then we'll get the priests, right? And, like, the idea is that eventually, almost in a way, all Israel is supposed to worship God on this mountain, right? God God is drawing them back to him, right? Mount Sinai is his holy mountain, and he's bringing the people to himself, but they're not ready for it yet. And so we see Moses going down the mountain again, and then from the top of the mountain, God is going to speak. This is where we get Exodus chapter 20, uh, which is... Um, probably one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, your God, in vain. For Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. There we have what goes down as the, um, the, the Bible calls them the ten words. We call them the ten commandments. Right? Those are the very first, uh, the first ten commandments that God delivers to the people of Israel. Uh, and what really sets these commandments apart from the rest of them is that these ones are spoken audibly from God, from the mountain, in the presence of all the people. However, um, the reason why the rest of them aren't going to be delivered this way is going to be made clear very shortly. Verse 18. All the people perceive the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. To me, this is very sad, right? Because we know that the people were supposed to stand at a distance, but... It seems like God's whole intention was to eventually draw them nearer, right? And we know for a fact that what God wanted was he wanted this intimate relationship with them. But what is it that they asked Moses to do? They want him to go to God for them because they're afraid that if they come to, come close to God that they will die. Yeah, they're so afraid of him that they think that he's going to kill them. Which means that they've kind of missed the whole point. Right? To me, this is a very sad moment here because, like, 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 think about this, right? It says that the people saw and they heard all the things that were happening and they trembled. And then they said, Moses, you go up there. And Moses responded and said, guys, you don't have to be trembling. God did this so that the fear of him would fall on you. Well, that's interesting because he says, the fear, like, God did this so that you would fear but apparently the fear that God wanted them to have was not the fear that they were expressing. Right? It's a different type of fear. Their fear was a fear that drew them away from God. Right? The fear that, Mo that God wanted them to have was a fear that would draw them near to him. Right? Because Moses is afraid of God. Right? He has the fear of Yahweh in him. But his fear of Yahweh is a fear that is so intense that he realizes he does not want to be distant from this God. Yes. Right? It's kind of like whenever you're a little kid playing on the playground and there's all these bullies going around, well, you know that you want to be best friends with the biggest guy at the playground because that guy is the guy who can defend you, yeah. right? Well, that's what God wanted them to do, right? I mean, God has done all these things for them and he has struck down the Egyptians. And he has struck down the Amalekites. He's done all of this to show them that they should fear him, but they should fear him through love, right? Their love for him, like... Because they should recognize that he did all this stuff for them. They don't have to be afraid of him just like smiting them because he loves them. But that's not the message they got. Right? Instead, they said, uh, I don't know. We would rather stay at a distance because we're afraid that he'll turn on us too. So what they do is it, it's once again gift versus the giver. Right? They want the gifts that God is giving them, but in many ways they're rejecting God himself. Right? They're saying, yes, we will have this whole covenant thing. We will do what God has asked us to do, but Moses, you can have the intimate relationship with God, 
right? You go up the mountain, and rather than God speaking directly to us, may he, may he speak through his prophet. And unfortunately, that's going to be how the whole history of Israel is going to work, right? They have rejected God, and so God is not going to speak to them publicly. He's going to speak through his prophets, right? There's always going to be a mediator between God and man, right? So we have those Ten Commandments delivered from the mountain, but going forward, God is going to speak through a man, right? Which I think is very heartbreaking. It's very sad, right? So even in this moment, uh, even in the honeymoon phase, right? Even as he's making his proposal, they're kind of already rejecting God. Uh, that's, that's a bummer, right? They're like, yes, we will, we will sign, like we'll sign the marriage document, but we don't want the level of intimacy that you're offering us. That's a little bit of a bummer to me. Isn't that kind of like religion uh, versus relationship? Um, I, a lot of people try to make that contrast. I don't really, I'm not a big fan of the religion versus relationship contrast because Christianity is the textbook definition of a religion. Um, but it is the, it is the definition of like this empty external religious activity. But yeah. Then Yahweh said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make another God beside me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. You shall make an altar of earth for me. Or, yeah, you shall make an altar of earth for me. You shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it or of cut stones. For if you wield it, for if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. And so, um, really what we have here is that now Moses is up on top of the mountain and he's receiving the law from God, right? And that's what we read in those verses right there. Right now, instead of God just proclaiming them to everybody, um, now Moses is up the mountain and what we're going to see over the course of the next few chapters is Moses is going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, metaphorically, I mean, so throughout the Bible uh, and throughout ancient Near Eastern um, religious texts in general, um, mountains are always associated with the gods. And it makes sense, right? Because earth is down low, and whenever you go up a mountain, it's like you're ascending to the heavens, right? And so, um, metaphorically, Moses is the mediator, right? Uh, if you remember the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the dream, the vision that Jacob had, right? Jacob's ladder, where he saw a ladder going up to heaven, right? Or a staircase, right? It's kind of like that's what Moses is doing here, right? He's going up to heaven, back down to earth, up to heaven, down to earth. He's not literally going to heaven, but remember, I mean, God is dwelling on top of the mountain, right? And so Moses is going to go back and forth. Um, this poor 80-year-old dude is having to go up and down this mountain a million times uh, just to deliver this stuff to the people. Uh, and so the last thing that people see here is they see Moses immersing into the thick cloud, right? And so Moses is able to enter in. Uh, and Moses is just going to be like, I mean, he's getting to be in the presence of God. This is so cool. Right? This is stuff that has not happened since like Adam and Eve. Right? Really, really neat. The cool thing is that we can kind of skip a lot of the next few chapters. Uh, because since we're focusing mainly on the story of the Bible, uh, well, the next few chapters are primarily the law. Right? And so whenever you actually read through a lot of these chapters, you'll notice that um, it's just laws being given to the people of Israel that we really don't need to focus on particularly right now. Right? But basically what we see over the course of the next few chapters is that God begins to detail to them what he wants them to do and how he wants them to live and what's going to exactly set them apart from everybody else. Right, so chapter 21, those are laws. Chapter 22, laws. Chapter 23, laws. Right, if you read through those chapters, you're going to see some of the initial laws that God gives the people of Israel to set them apart from everybody else. Chapter 24, though, is where we can pick up very briefly, uh, and then it's going to get more laws. Chapter 24, we read this. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, in the seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to Yahweh, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Right? So, after having received these chapters of, I mean, we, we call them chapters, but uh, after receiving all these laws, Moses goes down to them, 
and he gives them these initial laws. And the people say, yes, we'll do them, right? We agree, right? This is the, um, you know, this is the marriage ceremony, right? So if chapter 19 was the proposal, chapter 24 is the marriage, right? To where God says, all right, here are my vows to you. And they say, I do, right? That's what's happening here. Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as peace offerings to Yahweh. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the people say, we will do this, and he sprinkles the blood, and he says, behold the blood of the covenant. New Testament connection. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he got his closest friends together, his disciples, and he broke bread and gave them a cup of wine. When he gave them a cup of wine, do you remember what he said? Behold, this is my blood, of the new covenant shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what he's calling back to, right? He's calling back to two things. One thing is he is calling back to the shedding, of, like the killing of the Passover lamb, right? If you recall that back in the um, Exodus chapters, like what, nine through 12 in there, the Passover lamb was sacrificed and Jesus is identifying himself as the greater Passover lamb whose blood was shed so that it can be painted on the doorposts so that the avenger or like the avenging angel could pass over them, right? But this is also what he's referencing, right? Here we have another sacrifice being made, and now the people are being sprinkled with the blood, right? So it's not simply the blood over their doorpost, it is now blood on them, right? The blood is literally covering the people themselves. And the blood represents them identifying with the covenant, right? Behold, um, the blood of the covenant, which Yahweh has made with you in accordance with these words. Right? So he says, this is the blood of the covenant. By you being sprinkled with this, this is you saying that you agree to the terms and you will walk in obedience to his commandments. Whenever we take communion, that's what we're doing. Right? So um, whenever we say that it is a symbol, it's more than a symbol. Right? It is uh, a, vow, a vow renewal. That's really what communion is. Right? Every time we break the bread and we drink the cup, we are telling Jesus, yes, we are still part of this covenant. Right? Uh, the Mosaic Covenant is what we would call the Old Covenant, and what we currently identify with as Christians is the New Covenant. That'll come, like, the theology of that will come later on in the uh, Old Testament. So, we keep reading. Then Moses went up with uh, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles, of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. Right, so here they go up the mountain, and they get to see um, a vision of God that's comparable to that of the prophets later on. Right, where it seems like they are seeing the very throne room of God, God sitting up there, and they see a late, like this amazing image. Right, something that defies explanation in human terms, and they get to see it, and they get to celebrate a meal there. Right, um, recall that in ancient cultures, meals represented peace. Right? So, where formerly um, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden so they could no longer eat in the presence of God. Well, now Moses and Aaron and the priests are now eating in the presence of God. Now Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with Joshua his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. But to the elders he said, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Yahweh rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 
40 days and 40 nights. So we have seen the proposal. We have seen the marriage ceremony. And now, in just a second, we are about to see adultery. Not a very good start to the marriage. But right here, what happens is that God tells Moses to come up the mountain, and he is going to give Moses two stone tablets that detail the law of God, right? The Torah, right? That's what the word law is in Hebrew, right? Torah. Uh, we, we would call the Torah Genesis to Deuteronomy. Uh, most likely, these commandments, a lot of times we just depict the, like the Ten Commandments on them. Most likely, these, ten, like these two tablets have more than just the Ten Commandments on them. Right? We don't know exactly what all it has on there because, I mean, obviously it probably doesn't have anything beyond what happens in Exodus 32. Um, but it does have a good portion of the Torah on there. And um, also, most likely, like whenever you see the, uh, the tablets usually depicted, usually it'll be the Ten Commandments and you'll have five commandments on one, five commandments on the other. Probably not the case. Um, most likely, these are two replica tablets. Right? One tablet... It looks exactly like the other, right? They're like photocopies almost. Uh, and that's because most people would agree, like scholars would agree, um, that what God is doing here, he is engaging in what uh, ancient Near Eastern cultures called a suzerain vassal treaty, right? Uh, those are just fancy terms for basically God saying, I'm going to be your king, you're going to be my people, here are the agreements, right? And usually whenever a suzerain vassal treaty would be uh, brought about, um, you would usually make a copy for the king, a.k.a. the suzerain, and then you would make a copy for the people, a.k.a. the vassals, right? Uh, and basically this was just to make sure that both sides knew their terms of the agreement. Uh, and so whenever there's these two tablets, most likely it's not just half on one, half on the other. It's actually, um, you know, God's part of the deal and man's part of the deal. And the fact that the two tablets are being carried together shows that God is planning on being with the people, right? Like, like he is going to be intimate with them to where they don't need to have them separately, right? Because they're going to be with one another. And so the last thing that the people of Israel see of Moses for 40 days is Moses disappearing into the cloud. But it tells us, what did the people of Israel see? What was the cloud like in their eyes? Kind of like a cloud of thunder? A fire that consumed. A consuming fire, right? The last thing they see of Moses is immersing himself into a cloud that looks like a consuming fire, right? Uh, and we know a little trick about this, right? Because we know that... Oftentimes, God might have a thing that looks like a consuming fire, but it doesn't have to consume, right? Uh, we saw that back in Exodus chapters 3 and 4 with the burning bush, right? Moses knows this as well, right? Moses knows that all because the fire looks like it would consume, it doesn't have to, right? Because he saw the bush on fire, but it did not, be, it, it was not consumed, right? So Moses is comfortable enough with God to immerse himself in there, but the people of Israel, they see Moses go into this, and he's gone for 40 days and 40 nights. What are they going to think? He got consumed. They're going to think he got consumed. Mm -hmm. They're going to think that he is dead. Right? So we'll pick up with Israel in a second. Chapters 25 to 31, though. Um, if you've ever tried reading through the whole Bible in a year, uh, usually chapters 25 to 31 are the chapters that really begin to test you. Uh, because these are the chapters where you begin to start getting bored and you see your eyes start getting heavy. Uh, because what happens here is God begins to give... Moses uh, architectural details and architectural plans and blueprints for a structure that Moses is going to have the Israelites build. And if you're reading through this, you're going to be like, oh, this is boring. Why is this significant? Well, it's going to be very significant for a reason, and we'll explain why in a second. Um, but um, what we're going to read is 25 to 31. Those chapters detail this architectural blueprint for what we're going to call the tabernacle, right? Chapters 32 to 34 are going to give you a story. And then chapters 35 through 40 are going to give you almost the same exact architectural details all over again. Which tells us something about the end of the book of Exodus here. Apparently chapters 25 through 40 are all one section. Because what we have, it's almost like a sandwich. right? You've got architectural details over here, architectural details over here, a story in between. And these two sections are almost exactly alike. And whenever you're reading through it, you're like, oh my gosh, I already read through it once. Why do I have to read through it again? Well, that's where understanding the story is going to be so significant. So we're going to spend most of our time today on chapters 32 to 34, 
right? If you understand that story, you will understand everything around it. But just for the sake of time, uh, let me summarize to you chapters 25 to 31. Uh, in these chapters, uh, once again, you can read through them through, like you can get the finer details on your own. Um, God begins to detail to Moses plans for a special tent, right? And this tent is going to be God's portable home, right? Very similar to how Abraham was a sojourner who wandered through the wilderness in tents. So too, God himself is going to be a sojourner who sojourns amongst the people of Israel. And he is going to make his dwelling place amongst them, which once again is super duper cool because when's the last time we saw God and man dwell together? In the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Right? And so as you're reading the end of the book of Exodus, it almost feels like like a big section of the Bible is like coming to a head here because we have all these things calling back to the Garden of Eden. Right here we have God proposing to man. He's trying to initiate this special relationship with them. And he's wanting to live amongst them again in the same way that they dwelt with him in the garden. Right? And so we see that God is committed to making things work out with man. And sure enough, as you read through these architectural plans, a lot of it is very it has a lot of garden imagery. Right? Whenever you read about the Garden of Eden, you'll remember that it mentioned there were a lot of precious stones and there was a lot of gold. Well, whenever you read through the details of this plan, there's a lot of precious stones that are mentioned. There's a lot of gold. There's a lot of floral imagery. There's a lot of special colors like blue and purple and scarlet yarns that are going to be woven together. Well, this is all calling back once again to the Garden of Eden. What God is instructing Moses to do is he's going to have the people of Israel construct a portable Garden of Eden. Now, when I say a portable Garden of Eden, I'm not saying that there's actual trees in there. I'm not saying there's actual like bushes and fruit and stuff like that. Nothing like that. I'm saying that as the Garden of Eden was God's dwelling place with man, so too this tabernacle is going to be the same thing. right? It's not going to be nearly as grand. It's not going to be as perfect as it once was because a, a big aspect of this is that there's an altar there, right? an altar for sacrifice to atone for people's sins. The Garden of Eden, there didn't need to be an altar right? because there was no sin. right? There were no sacrifices needed. right? And so this is still, it's a shadow of what the Garden of Eden was but we get to see that God is wanting to take steps back in that direction, right? He is wanting to mend things, and he's going to begin with the people of Israel, right? If they are his bride and he is the groom, then it's only fitting for the groom and the bride to dwell together, mm -hmm. right? Going way back to Genesis 2 in the Garden of Eden, for it is this reason that a man leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh, right? Well, if Yahweh is the groom and Israel is the bride, then the two need to become one flesh. They need to dwell with one another. And so, um, in many ways, this is almost the betrothal period, right? So we got to see the marriage ceremony kind of, or I guess we got to see the betrothal ceremony in chapter 24, right? So you have the, the proposal in chapter 19, the betrothal in chapter 24, and now chapters 25 through 31, I never even worded it like this, but in many ways that's what it is. Um, this is the part, uh, if you know anything about ancient cultures, whenever um, a person would get, like whenever a couple would get betrothed, they would be legally married, but then the husband would leave for a time to prepare a place for him and his bride to dwell together. Well, that's kind of what God's doing here, right? God is going and he's preparing the place and he's giving Moses the instructions. But you know what the heartbreaking part about this whole thing is? Even as God is preparing a place for him and his bride to dwell together, the bride is cheating on him. That's the heartbreaking part of the story, right? And so here we are, chapters 25 through 31, reading about this amazing temple, this amazing, like what's well, called the tabernacle, but a temple is the place where God dwells, right? This amazing temple where God is going to dwell with his people. But then we get to chapter 32, and we get to see what the people of Israel are doing at the base of the mountain. It's not good. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So what do the people say? The people are like, <clears throat> This Moses person is delaying. You know, We don't know what's happened to him. No. Make us a God. Yeah. Know. 
God's abandoned us. Yeah, they say, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. Right? Last time we saw him, he was immersed into a thick cloud. And notice, I just want to highlight, Moses is going to be up there for 40 days. Um, mm-hmm. Which means that this couldn't be happening on day 40. Right? This is happening earlier than that. Because what's going to happen is they're going to have to gather a bunch of materials together. They're going to start worshiping a statue, all that stuff. So this is probably, I don't know, 30 days in or something like that. Right? So they said, hey, we haven't seen Moses in a while. We need a God to lead us. Which is ironic because if they look at the top of the mountain, God's presence is still there. Right? They can still see it. The consuming fire is still there. But they're like, hey, we don't know what's happened to Moses. We need a God who can lead us now. Which is ironic because remember the whole reason they came into the wilderness was to learn to serve Yahweh in the wilderness. But they don't want to serve Yahweh. They want to get to the promised land. Right? They want their best life now. They, they want to get through the wilderness. Forget this wilderness. No, we want the promised land. That's what God get, promised us. Make us a God who will actually lead us there. The God who's with Moses, he's apparently taking his sweet time. We don't even know Moses is still alive. Well, you would expect Aaron to say, guys, give Moses time, right? But that's not what Aaron says. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings, which are in your ears, of the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. As we're going to see, this isn't violating the first commandment. This is violating the second commandment. Right? The first commandment is, You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is, Don't make a graven image. Uh, well, what they're doing is they're making a graven image. And they say, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. This is ridiculous, though. Right? I mean, like, what are you talking about? But you just made this. I mean, this, this is purely just delusional. Right? There's nothing factual about this. This is like, But this is what a lot of people do. Right? I mean, I've had conversations with people like this where they have listened to certain preachers. Uh, and I'm like, hey, you realize that that preacher, they're not speaking truth. And they're like, well, I know they're not speaking the truth. But, like, it makes me feel good. Feel good. It's like, wait. <laughs> but this is what the human heart does. Right? A lot of times we're less concerned with what is true and we're simply concerned with what feels good. But that's not right. right. right? We shouldn't want to simply do something because it feels right. But to the Israelites, like, they know that this isn't the God that took them out of Egypt. Because, I mean, this statue has only existed for like 10 minutes. Right? There's no way this is the God who took them out of Egypt. The God who took them out of Egypt is literally on top of the mountain. They can see him. But this is the God that will give them what they want. If they use, like this God, this God won't speak back to them. They can speak on behalf of this God, and this God will have to do whatever they say. And so they can act like they're worshiping God when really they're just serving themselves. And so they say, yep, this is the God who took us out of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. He even calls the staff Yahweh, uh, the calf Yahweh. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The word for play there in Hebrew um, probably suggests something more sexual in nature. Um, So what they're doing is they're worshiping Yahweh um, in the mean, like by the form of a golden calf, which is wrong because Yahweh cannot be confined to an image like that. Uh, And they're worshiping him like the pagan nations would worship golden calves and how they would worship pagan idols. Right? So this is lewd, it's terrible, it's horrible. Keep in mind, up on the mountain, God is making a place for him and his bride to dwell together. And you would like to think that um, maybe they would get away with this without Yahweh having to know what his bride is doing, but Yahweh knows everything. And he knows exactly what his bride is doing. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You see how God doesn't associate himself with the people anymore? He says, Hey, Moses, go down to your people. 
right? Because they've made a statue. They don't want me anymore. They're not my people, right? Here I was preparing this whole tabernacle to give them. I was preparing all these things that I wanted to give them just so I could show my love to them. They're already worshiping another god. And they have the audacity to call it by my name. I mean, it's kind of grotesque if you think about it, right? This, like, imagine that you were married to somebody for a week, right? And imagine you went to work for a day, and when you came back, you found your spouse hanging out with a robot that looked like you but couldn't speak and couldn't do anything. Or actually, you're not even a robot, just a plastic doll. A plastic doll that looked like you. And they called it by your name, and they would take it out to eat, and the doll couldn't do anything, right? Do you not see how grotesque that is? It's ridiculous. But that's what the people of Israel are doing. Like Yahweh is a living and breathing God, right? He parts waters. He sends plagues. He can give them food in the desert. This is a golden statue. And so I don't blame God for being like, hey, Moses, your people are causing trouble. You should probably go check on them. Because, I mean, this is his bride. Right here, God is like He has flexed. He has flexed. He has wooed them. He has showed them everything He's willing to do, and this is what they offer Him in return: adultery. Right, right off the bat, He is going and preparing their dream house for them to dwell together. And what do they do? Cheat on. It's terrible. Yahweh said to Moses, "I have seen this people, and behold, they are a stiff-necked people. Now then, let me alone, and that my anger may burn against them." And I will destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. So he makes a proposal to Moses. He says, Moses, you go down there and um, just let the people know I'm about to destroy them. And I'll start again with you. And if I'm being honest, this probably had to be the most attractive thing ever in Moses' ears. I mean, think about it. I mean, Moses' life was going pretty good until these people came along. Right? I mean, I guess he was dwelling as a shepherd in the wilderness and stuff like that, but he seemed pretty content with his life. Things started getting tough whenever he had to deal with these obstinate people constantly grumbling and complaining and wearing him down. And I mean, there's even times already where they've been going through the wilderness and he's like, God, they're about to stone me. Right? I mean, up until these people came into his life, Moses was chilling out. He was having a great time. These people made it tough. And now God says, you know what, Moses? I'm going to destroy them. Start again with you. You can be the new Father Abraham, right? Whenever people talk about all the things that Yahweh has done to bring his people back to himself, they'll talk about you as their founder. They won't talk about the people of Israel. They'll talk about the people of Moses. So he would be able to get away from all his troubles. He would be able to, you know, indulge, indulge his own pride. That sounds really good. But notice how Moses responds. Then Moses entreated Yahweh as God. He said, Oh Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought up out of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Do you see how Moses plays the Uno reverse card? Mm -hmm. God said, Hey Moses, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. Moses says, Uh uh, these are your people whom you brought out of Egypt. He says, You ain't getting out of it that easy, buddy. You already said those vows, you already made the covenant. She might be cheating on you, but she's still your wife. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will surely multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land which I have spoken I will give to you and your seed and they shall inherit it forever. Moses is a smart dude. Right? Keep in mind, back in chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus, he was the most reluctant prophet in the world. But he has seen things that he cannot unsee. And he understands God better than anybody else thus far in Scripture. And he reminds God of two things. He reminds God of his end goals, but his future goals and his past promises. Right? His future goals are to bring all nations back to himself. Remember what he said to Abraham? In you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, Moses says, God... You can destroy these people, right? That's fine. But if you do that, think about what the Egyptians are going to think. They're going to think that you're an evil God who doesn't deserve to be served. Or they might think that you weren't powerful enough to keep them alive in the wilderness. Neither of those are good. Neither of those are going to drive the Egyptians to their knees in worship of you. So if your goal is to bring the Gentiles in, 
if you want to bring the non-Jewish people to you as well, not the non-Israelites, he says, you can't destroy them. And then he says, furthermore, uh, you made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying that these people would be the ones to inherit the land. And so Moses, he just understands God very well. He says, God, I know what your future goal is in all of this, and I know what your past promises are, and so I'm going to need you to overlook the present sin of your people. Right? <laughs> this is smart. Right? This is how you convince God to do something. Uh, and ultimately, it seems like what God was doing here is he was testing Moses to see whether or not Moses understood him well. Uh, it's very similar to whenever God tested Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like Moses, he just understands exactly, like, if you're wanting to get God to do something, if, if you're praying and you want God to perform that prayer, remind God of his past promises or remind him of his future goals. Right? Um, the last thing you really want to do is highlight your present self because usually that's the number one way to get him to not obey it. God, look at me. I'm so righteous and pure. Can't you just give me a Ferrari? And he's going to be like, no. <laughs> no. Uh, that's why Jesus says, ask anything in my name and it will be done for you. Right? Moses asking in Yahweh's name. He says, by your name, you have proclaimed that it is your desire to bless the nations and draw them to you. By your name, you have desired it. You promise to bless Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's looking to the past, looking to the future. Uh, and, and what we read is that, ultimately, Yahweh changed his mind about the harm which he had said he would do to his people. Yahweh is convinced. Um, that's really cool. I love that. I just love that Moses, like, he, he gets God so well. However, that being said, Moses is not happy with the people. So don't mistake that for, like, Moses forgiving the people. Notice that Throughout that whole thing, he never once says that the people deserve to be, like, forgiven. Right? So Moses is about to go down, and he's about to, he's about to discipline the people himself. But at least the people won't be destroyed. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and on the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. I mean, just those details there. Like, look at the care with which God went about writing these tablets for them. Right? I mean, like, it's like God, it's like he made it with love. Right? He filled it up on both sides. All of the laws, all of the commandments, their covenantal agreement. He's written it all out. Now, when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. But Moses said, it's not the sound of cry or triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat. But the sound of singing I hear. He says, Moses, he says, Joshua, that isn't a war. It's a party. And they shouldn't be partying right now. Yeah. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from the hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Even before the covenant could be delivered, it has been broken. Right? That's, that's what that represents. Right? The tablets being shattered at the mountain before they could even be delivered to the people. That's how quickly they chose sin. In many ways, like the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Right? I mean, we don't know how long they were in the Garden of Eden, but, I mean, you get to read Adam and Eve meet each other for the first time at, at the end of chapter 2. At the beginning of chapter 3, they choose sin. Right? It does not take long. It does not take man long to choose sin. Right? They literally just agreed to this marriage 40 days earlier. Less than a month and a half later, here we are. The covenant's already broken. Not good. He took the calf which they made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. He says, you want this, you want this to be your God? You want to worship this God? Good. Ingest him. Right? He's reminding them how fleeting, like how fake this God is. This God can't save you. This God couldn't save itself. The only thing this God can do is serve as a meal for you. Um, I imagine they probably got pretty sick from this. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought the, such a great sin upon them? And look at the audacity of Aaron here. Aaron said, Don't let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go out before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up in the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, technically that's correct. right? All of that is true. So he's very accurate in recounting the sin of the people, 
<clears throat> but notice how inaccurate he is in recounting his own sin. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Huh, I don't remember reading that. I thought I remember it saying that he chiseled it out with his own hand. So he's, he's sort of lied to uh, Moses. Uh, he, sort of, yeah. He, he, he totally did. lied. Yeah. Um, if anything, who's, who's he actually blaming for this? If you throw a, a bunch of gold into a fire and a golden calf jumps out, who did that? The only explanation would be God. Exactly, right? The only explanation would be that it's ordained by God, right? I mean, like, Moses, I mean, the fire didn't create it. Right? So it's almost like he's doing what Adam and Eve did. Right? Remember whenever God confronted Adam? And Adam said, this woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. Right? Aaron's almost kind of like, I mean, at least Adam was correct. Right? God did give the woman to him. Right? Aaron's just making stuff up. Right? But we've already seen that Aaron's fine with making stuff up because he said, these are your gods of Israel. Right? So Aaron's just blowing smoke. He's just making stuff up because he doesn't want to look bad. And he literally makes up one of the most ridiculous stories ever just because he's unwilling to admit that he messed up. He's like, oh, the people forced me. I just threw it in. Boom. The calf showed up. That's not how this works. Right? You, then why is it that I still see the chisel in your hand? Right? The gold dust is still on your fingers, Aaron. Yes? That's uh, something I've learned about uh, humans in uh, life is we don't want to take responsibility for our own sin. Nope. We, we want to blame others. Yep. God. Big no no. Yep. It's going to be very much like King Saul. Mm -hmm. Now, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision amongst their enemies, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. He said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp. And kill every man his brother, and every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourself today to Yahweh, for every man has been against his son and against his brother, in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. This moment right here is going to be why the Levites become the priests. Right. So if you remember... Um, Simeon and Levi were known for their violence back in Genesis when they killed the people of Shechem. And the Levites in general were not looked at with very high praise from that moment forward. Moses is from the tribe of Levi. Aaron is from the tribe of Levi. And whenever Moses says, if you're for Yahweh, come over here, it's the Levites who come over there. right? And so since the Levites were willing to defend Yahweh's honor, their reputation is going to get boosted here. Right? Even though Aaron is the one who led them astray, um, it seems like they repent. On the next day, Moses did, said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin. Now I am going to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Right? So Moses says, Guys, y'all really screwed up. I'm going to go see if I can fix this. Right? He, he already got God to agree to not destroy them. Uh, and now, like, so Moses is the one who had a bunch of them killed, right? Um, but at least they're not totally destroyed. But there's still some other mending that needs to take place, right? So all because God has agreed not to destroy them doesn't mean that God necessarily wants to still marry them, right? I mean, whenever your wife cheats on you before y'all even had a chance to officially tie the knot, it doesn't really bode well for the marriage, right? So he says, let me see if I can fix this for y'all. So he's going to go up. Then Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a, gold, a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. That's pretty bold. Moses says, God, you need to stay with these people. Forgive them. Right? That's what you got to do. you got to forgive them. And if you're not willing to forgive them, I need you to forget about me too. Right? Because remember, God had said, okay, I'm going to destroy them, and I'm going to start again with you. Well, Moses, take, he's getting that off the picture. Right? He says, no, that's not an option. Right? I go with the people. Right? He is, like, what he's doing here, he's offering him, like, he's doing for Israel what Judah did for Benjamin. Right? Uh, if you remember at the end of Genesis. 
right? Where he is offering himself in place, right? Moses is innocent here. Israel is guilty. And Moses says, nope, I'm going with the people, right? It's not like, even if, like, because, you know, God could propose, oh, well, I won't destroy them, but I'm still going to start again with you and I'm going to leave them behind. And Moses says, no, if you're going to, if you won't forgive them, then you need to forget, forget about me totally, right? Blot me out of the book, right? Just forget about me too. I am with the people. Uh, what Moses is doing is being a very good leader here. Uh, and I think it's because he knows Yahweh's heart. He just knows that God is faithful. Yahweh said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of the book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then Yahweh smote the people because of what they had, because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. Right? And so God does punish the people, and certain people who had led the sin, they are punished for this, and God has them killed. But he says, okay, I can forgive them. I can do that. And he even says, I am going to even send my angel, uh, the word angel is messenger, right? I will send my messenger before you to lead you into the promised land. But you notice how it's kind of ambiguous who the messenger is, right? Who is, like, you know, in the, in the past, whenever it says the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, it seems to be Yahweh himself. But Yahweh doesn't say that. He says, I will send my messenger before you. But Moses isn't going to be satisfied with that. Who does Moses want to go before them? God. Yahweh himself. So we get to chapter 33. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your seed I will give it. I will send my messenger before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. So here's where God clarifies. He says, I will send my messenger before you, but I'm not going before you. He says, I'll, I'll send a messenger who is able to drive out all the people. I will give you the promised land. I will give you all the things that you want, but I'm not going. These people are too stiff-necked. If I went with them, I mean, heck, it only took me a month and a half to want to destroy them. If I go with you all again, <laughs> this is just going to happen again and again and again. If it wasn't today, it's going to be a month, of now, a month from now, three years from now, 40 years from now, three generations from now. Eventually, I'm going to destroy them. So he says, Moses, y'all go on ahead, but I'm not going with you. I'll give you the promise, but you won't get me. When the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning. And none of them put on his ornaments. For Yahweh had said to Moses, Say the sons of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. So the people of Israel hear this, and they realize what they've done. Right? They wanted a God to go before them. And they failed to realize that the God who went before them was already there. And now that God says, oh, you want somebody else? Fine, go find somebody else, because I'm not going with. And they realize that they really messed up. Right? This is like you never realized what you had until you lost it. Right? That's what it is, right? They had the, the most amazing groom in the world proposed to them and was preparing this amazing place for them to dwell together. And they screwed it up. And he's so gracious that he's even saying, you know what, I'll still give you the house. I'll still give you the estate. I'll give you all of that. But you can go live in it on your own. And they realized, but you're the one who made it special. Right? Like, they, we don't want the land. We don't want, we don't want the house. We want you. And it's like, well, you should have thought of that ahead of time. Right? Like, yeah, you can have the house, but you won't have a home because I'm not going to be there. And now they're getting to realize that they've really, really, really messed up. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp a good distance from the camp, and he called it the Tent of Meeting. And everyone who sought Yahweh would go out to the Tent of Meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about, whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of the tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And Yahweh would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, 
all the people would stand, would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Thus Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. Right? So we have this contrast, right? The people of Israel realize what they've lost, and now they're just admiring what Moses has found. Right? Moses is speaking to God face to face. We're going to see that he's never seen God. Right? So when it says face to face, it's not saying that they're literally looking at each other. Right? The idea is, because, I mean, that's going to come relevant in just another chapter. Or actually just at the end of this chapter. But um, um, they're speaking face to face in the sense of they just talk to each other. Right? Just like me and you, y'all, like how we can just sit and talk to each other right now. And after we finish, we're just going to like be talking and hanging out. That's what it was like to Moses and God. I can't think of another character in all of scripture who had a relationship like this. Right? Where they're just, just talking with God. What do they talk about? I want to know. Right? I mean, Moses would just go in there in the tent and just chat with God. But you want to know an even cooler detail? When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So Moses talked with God, but even whenever Moses left, Joshua stayed. And Joshua kept talking longer. That's such a cool detail. Joshua is like, Joshua's like this unsung hero. Like we talk about Joshua being like, you know, he fought the battle of Jericho and stuff like that. Joshua is cool. Like Joshua is just a really cool dude. He is going to be the person who ultimately leads the people into the promised land. He's going to be the successor of Moses. Uh, he's not nearly as prominent as Moses, but this dude, he just seems like a really good guy. He just understands God super well, probably because he spent so much time talking with him. But now we've got to figure out what we're going to do about this whole situation that God proposed earlier. Right? God said, I'm going to send my messenger before you. And Moses has been thinking about this. And he's trying to figure out how they're going to handle it. Then Moses said to Yahweh, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Right? Because Mo Moses is calling out what we already highlighted. You said you're going to send your messenger, but I don't know who that is. Right? Who is your messenger? Am I your messenger? Right? Is Joshua your messenger? Who's the messenger? Right? What, like, 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 who's going to lead us? You said you're going to give the people the land. You're going to, you said that you're going to wipe out the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, all them people. But who is it you're going to send? Tell me. I want to know who it is. Who is the messenger of Yahweh? Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. So you see how I'm once again calling back on God's words? He says, God, you've said that you're going to send your messenger before us. I want to know who that is, right? I want specifics, who you're talking about. Also, you said that I found favor in your sight. If that's so true, listen to me, right? He says, I, I want to know if I actually have found favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses, he's just a good leader, right? He's doing all this stuff because ultimately, what is Moses trying to convince God to do? Go, them. go with the people forgive them right yeah. he's saying God like God who is the messenger is it somebody else or is it you because I really want it to be you have I found favor in your sight if I have found favor in your sight then I really want you to prove that by going with the people remember that they are your people right you have already claimed them yes they might have broken a covenant yes they might have cheated and I know it hurts but you can forgive and he said, this is what God says, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Amen. So who's going to go with him? God. Yahweh. God. Yahweh says, I'll, I'm the messenger. I'm the one who's going to go with you. Right? And, and that's what Moses was hoping for. And you see this in the next verse. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? So he says, good. That's what I was hoping for. Because if you're not going, we're not going either. If the messenger was anybody but you, we were going to die here in the wilderness. Because I'm not following anybody but you. If you're going for us, though, then we'll go. Because you're the one that makes us distinct. The promised land, that doesn't matter. You're the thing that matters, right? You're the thing that makes us distinct. Who cares about a land flowing with milk and honey? A land flowing with milk and honey is terrible if you're not with the God of Israel. 
right? Yahweh is the one that makes us special, right? He would rather dwell in the dusty desert with God than in a land flowing with milk and honey without him. Moses, is just cool. he's just cool, right? And I love comparing this to the Moses that we met at the beginning of Exodus, right? In chapters three and four, the most reluctant prophet in the world, uh, other than, I guess, Jonah. <laughs> um, but Moses was so reluctant, but he's seen things he can't unsee, right? He has seen the glory of God. And he's like, God, we're not leaving here without you, right? If you're not leaving, then we're staying here until you decide to change your mind, right? So I'm glad that you're the messenger going before us. Yahweh said to Moses, I will also do this thing for you which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. You get the impression that he's doing it more for the sake of Moses than anybody else. It seems like Moses was so caught up in the moment right here that he can't help but ask the, make the following request. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And Yahweh said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Um, so this is what confirms to us that whenever it said Moses spoke to God face to face, it wasn't saying that he literally saw God. It was talking about, you know, they, they spoke on friendly terms, like back and forth, like friends. So Moses is so caught up in this. He's so consumed with his desire to be near to God that he says, God, I just, I just want to see you. Which is really funny because he says, I want to see your glory. But if you think about it, Moses has already seen more of God's glory than anybody else on the face of the planet. Yeah. He has seen God in the form of a burning bush. He has seen God rain down 10 plagues on the people of Egypt. He has seen waters part, and he has seen armies float to the seashore dead, having been drowned by God's power. He has seen clouds of fire and smoke and thunder descending upon a mountain. He has followed a pillar of cloud and fire through the desert. He has entered into a consuming fire and has spoke with God face to face. If there's anybody else in the entire Bible who has seen God's glory more, I mean, it'd be Jesus. But then Moses says, see, show me your glory. He says, I've seen all these things, but that's not enough. I want to see you. And God says, well, I can't do that. Like, nobody can see me and live. I'm too powerful. Right? It's just, it, it's just too much, right? Like, our eyes can't even handle looking at the sun whenever it's at noon. Right? Like, you think that you can handle seeing the guy who made the sun? He says, you can't see me and live. But he says, you can't do this. He always said, behold, there is a place by me. And you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So he says, Moses, I will let you see as much as you can handle. And that's it. But I will proclaim my name to you. And I'll let you know who I am and what I'm made of. Now he always said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. All right, so we have a renewal of the covenant. This is really good. Right? I mean, this is exciting stuff. We get to see that the marriage covenant is being renewed. That's good, right? Uh, th this is very encouraging that God is willing to go through this again. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of the mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of Yahweh. This amazing moment. You can just imagine Moses saying, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then God descends. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So Yahweh passed before Moses, but like he said, Moses can't see him. Moses can just see part of him. But he gives something greater than that. He allows, like, 
he gives Moses a description of himself. He proclaims his name, Yahweh, Yahweh God, slow to anger, abounding in hesed and truth. Right? He loves giving people what they don't deserve, and he loves being faithful to people. Amazing. He's slow to anger. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He feels his people's pain. He loves to give things. He will show compassionate love, loving kindness, hesed. He will show it to thousands. But he also won't overlook sin. Right? So he'll be gracious, but he can't ignore sin. Right? And so sin will have consequences, and sin will be punished. But if somebody repents, he will forgive them. Right? So he, he's declaring exactly who he is. He says, if you want to know who I am, if you want to know who the God of Israel is, this is who I am. He passes by. He proclaims it. Probably one of the most amazing moments in all scripture. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. I love it. it says that he made haste. Right? He couldn't get to the ground fast enough. He said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go in our midst even though the people are so stiff-necked, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. Do you notice how Moses keeps asking the same thing, even though God has already said he's going to do it? God already said, I'm going to go with you. And Moses said, good, because you're not going with us, we're not leaving. And then God passes by him and says, God, please go with us. Right? It's like, even though God has said, I'm going to be with you, Moses is like, good, please, 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 don't leave us. This is too great. Right? Moses more than anybody else, has been in the presence of God and he understands the presence of God. And he says, how can we ever enjoy not being here? He says, please go with us. Forgive us of our sin. Just be kind with us and go with your people. The rest of chapter 34 I can summarize fairly easily uh, because um, what we see is that we see the covenant being renewed. And God begins to give the law again. These are written on the tablets. Which then leads to verse 29. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that Yahweh had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. Then Moses, uh, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Fun fact about this verse, um, or these verses. Uh, in earlier Bibles, there was a mistranslation here. And rather than it saying that Moses' face glowed, um, they accidentally mistranslated it, and they translated it as Moses had grown horns. Uh, and so if you look, like in the Renaissance time period, if you look at artwork depicting Moses, you'll see that Moses has horns. Um, there's a very famous statue created by Michelangelo. Um, I've actually seen it in Rome. And, or maybe, I think it was in Rome. It's somewhere in Italy. Um, but the statue is, uh, it, it's Moses sitting, sitting there with the Ten Commandments, and he's got the horns. It's a fun little factoid. Uh, okay, so this section right here uh, is uh, I, one of my favorite sections of the entire Bible. Uh, once again, we have that kind of chiastic structure going on here. Uh, and... Fun fact, if you ever want to do a, um, a fun seven-day devotional on the YouVersion Bible app, yours truly uh, wrote a devotional on these chapters. Um, chapters 32 to 34 on the YouVersion Bible app, it's called A Glimpse of Glory, I think. And so if you're ever wanting a seven-day devotional, there's one for you. Um, but this is how it's structured. You'll notice that the, um, you know, the things correlate, right? So the whole section in chapter 32 begins with... Israel crafting a golden image to, worry, uh, to worship in the place of Yahweh. And the section ends with Moses' radiant image leading people to worship Yahweh. Right? And so you have a God made by man versus a man made by God. Right? So at the beginning, the Israelites create a fake God uh, and they worship it in place of Yahweh. But at the end, you have God creating a man that is radiant like him. And that man leads them to worship the true God. Right? And then, if you work your way in, 
um, you can see the different parallels, right? So next, you have Yahweh threatening to destroy Israel and start again with Moses, contrasted by Yahweh renewing his covenant with Israel. Then you have Yahweh threatening to deny Israel his presence going forward. And then you have that contrast by Moses requesting Yahweh's presence going forward. And then in the center of it all, Yahweh's presence passes before Moses and Yahweh declares who he is. All right. So why is all of this so essential? Right? Because these chapters right here are going to um, pave the way for the tabernacle to be built. Why is it so essential? Why did we need this section, this story? First off, it's historical. But what's the point of it? Thinking it's the presence of God. Yes. That's one point. What is the purpose or the theme of chapters 16 through 40? Serving God in the wilderness. Serving God in the wilderness. Right? That's what these chapters are about. Right? Before them, you have instructions on how to build the tabernacle. Afterwards, you have the construction of the tabernacle. Chapters 32 to 34, it teaches you what it looks like to serve God in the wilderness. Right? And all of it is about seeking the presence of God above all else. Right? Realizing it's not about the gift, it's about the giver. Right? The Israelites, the reason why they turned to idolatry is because they wanted a God like themselves. They wanted a God made in man's image. Right? They wanted a God who would give them what they wanted, a God who would lead them into the promised land. God didn't want them to worship them because of what he had to give them. He wanted them to worship him because of who he is. Same thing with Jesus. Right? I've mentioned this story several times already. Whenever the people followed Jesus after the feeding 5,000, he says, You want bread? I'm the bread of life. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. Right? He was, he was frustrated for the same reasons. Right? Jesus... I mean, he's God, right? I mean, he has the same passion, right? Whenever people follow Jesus because of what they want from him, it does not work, right? Jesus says, I want you to follow me for me, right? If you love your father or your mother or your brother or your sister more than me, you're not worthy of me, right? You must deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me, right? If you don't count the cost, you're not worthy to be my disciple, right? You need to count the cost before you follow, right? That's what Jesus emphasizes time and time again is what God emphasizes here. Right? The way that you serve God in the wilderness is by realizing that you have everything you need even in the wilderness. Right? You don't need the promised land. All you need is Him. And it's better to dwell in the dusty desert with God than in the land flowing with milk and honey without Him. Right? That's what we need to realize now as well. Right? From a practical perspective, we have to realize, like a lot of times, like whenever we present the gospel, we make it all about like, hey, believe in God so you can go to heaven. No, I say believe in God, and guess what? You do get to go to heaven. That's cool, right? Those are separate things, though. Believe in God because of who he is. Believe in God because he is worthy. Believe in God because the God of all creation has allowed us to enter into his presence. Then, also, cool consequence of those things, you get to go to heaven. You get peace and love and joy and all these things. But don't make it about the gift. Make it about the giver, right? That's what it means to serve God in the wilderness. And so... Whenever you read the final chapters of Exodus, what do you get? The tabernacle being constructed. You go to chapters 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. And when you read those, uh, and into chapter 40 as well, uh, you see that, sure enough, everything that God commanded in chapters 25 to 31 is fulfilled in these chapters. Right? So, once again, if you're just reading through it, you're, kind of, you're going to be kind of bored. Because you're reading it, you're like, oh my gosh, it's just like going on and on about the same old details. But if you understand what God is doing, there's an extra layer of excitement to it. Because if you read those early parts, you're like, ooh, God's designing a place for him to dwell amidst his people. He's creating a new Garden of Eden. And you're reading the details of the tabernacle and it's getting you excited. And then you see how the people cheat on God. And they commit adultery. And you realize that they might have just ruined the whole thing. And then by the end of the story, you realize, oh, God forgave them. God's going to stay with them. And then sure enough, you flip to chapter 35, and you're reading the people going about doing exactly what God commanded. God said to build an altar. They built the altar. God said to build the tent. They built the tent. God said to build these stands. They built the stands. God said to build the lamp. They built the lamp. Like you're, you're reading it. You're like, oh, this is it, right? This is the moment. Like 
there's this extra excitement as you're reading it because you're like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like, Garden of Eden is being constructed in the middle of the wilderness. And it's all culminating to the very end of chapter 40. And this is how the book of Exodus ends. Actually, let me begin. Um, let me begin with actually verse 17. Um, just because I think if you start with verse 17, you'll be able to appreciate um, some of the repetition. Now in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle and laid its sockets and set its boards and inserted its bars and erected its pillars. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering on the tent, uh, the covering of the tent on top of it, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Then he took the testimony and put it into the ark and attached the poles to the ark and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up a veil of the screen and screened off the ark of the testimony just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Then he put up the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil. He set the arrangement of the bread in order uh, wait sorry he set the arrangement of bread in order on it before Yahweh just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Do you see the repetition there? No. Just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Then he placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle. He lighted the lamps before Yahweh, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Then he placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the veil. And he burned fragrant incense on it, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. Then he set up the veil for the doorway of the tabernacle. He set the altar of the burnt offering before the doorway of the tabernacle in the tent of meeting. And he offered on it the burnt offering and the meal offering, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. He placed the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar and put it and put water in it for washing. From it Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they entered the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar they washed just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. He erected the court and all around the tabernacle of the altar and hung the veil for the gateway of the court. Thus Moses finished the work. Do you feel the excitement there? Right? It's like I mean this is exciting stuff because the thing is God could have said, you know what, forget it, scrap the tabernacle, I'm not dwelling with you. But instead he said, get to work. And so they're doing it. And finally in these final verses, boom, just as Yahweh commanded, just as Yahweh commanded, just as Yahweh commanded, just as Yahweh commanded, and then boom, the tabernacle is complete. Almost. Because a house isn't truly complete until somebody comes and lives in it, right? That's how the book of Exodus ends. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of the house of Israel. There we go. So, God comes to dwell in the midst of his people. And in many ways, like I said, the end of Exodus mirrors the beginning of Genesis, right? To where the story is not yet complete, right? Because we know that God wants to dwell with his people forever. and He doesn't want to be confined to a tabernacle and he doesn't want to just dwell with Israel. He wants to dwell with the nations, right? So we know that the story isn't complete, but in many ways, the story from Genesis 1 to Exodus chapter 40, uh, it brings like part one to an end, right? Because now uh, we've seen the fall, and now we've seen how God has taken a step in the direction of resolving everything, mm -hmm. right? God is once again dwelling with his people, but he's still cut off from them, right? He still has a covenant to fulfill, but he's at least with them, right? The Garden of Eden has been established, but it's a portable one, and it's one that can just be broken down and transported and stuff, right? So it, it's not a permanent... Like, it's not a permanent place of residing, right? It's not a permanent abode, but it's a step in the right direction. And so, chapters 1 through 15, let my people go. 16 through 40, that they may serve me in the wilderness, right? And what better way to serve him by, by learning, than by learning to dwell in his presence and therefore having his presence come to dwell with them. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you look at chapter 24 through 40, you also have a broader chiastic structure there as well, right? Chapter 24 is where God and them make the covenant, right? That is where you have the betrothal ceremony 
And then finally, chapter 40, um, this is whenever the marriage is finally consummated, right? Whenever you actually have God and Israel dwelling together as husband and wife, right? So you have that contrast. Tabernacle instructions given in chapters 25 to 31. Tabernacle instructions obeyed, chapters 35 to 40. The covenant broken, chapter 32. Covenant renewed, chapter 34. Yahweh's presence in the wilderness, chapter 33 and 34. Right? And so, uh, whenever you get, like, the center of the chiasm is always the focus of it. Right? When you look at the center, that is the main point, And everything else around it serves to contextualize that point. And so you realize that in order for God's covenant to be realized, and in order for God's presence to come dwell with the people, the people need to learn to dwell with him in the wilderness. Same is true for us nowadays. Right? The only way we are going to live with God in heaven is if we learn to live with God here on earth. Right? That's the only way it works. Right? God has made a covenant to us. Right? But if we don't learn to be faithful on earth and if we don't place our faith in him now, we will not dwell with him forever. Right? We are currently in the Exodus 33 to 34 stage. Right? Where we are asking God to go before us and to send his messenger before us, guiding us from day to day, teaching us how to serve and obey him, even though we cannot see him. Right? We cannot bow down to golden calves. We have to learn to serve God in the wilderness. Um, not because we want the promised land, but expecting that he will give us the promised land. And not only will he give it to us, but he will guide us in. Right? So that's where we're currently at. What's the point? Israel needed to learn to serve God in the wilderness in order for his presence to come into their midst. Just to set up where we're heading next week, next week my goal is an ambitious one. I am wanting for us to finish the Torah. Right? Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy all in one week. Um, it'll be a little bit easier because there's less narrative in those books. Um, but it'll still be very challenging. So we're gonna, we might end up going a little bit long, or I'm just going to try to move kind of quick. Uh, it'll be kind of cool. Um, but just to set up Leviticus here, um, just so that we can just jump right in next week, we now have a problem. right? Because if you read the end of the book of Exodus, you'll notice it said, Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. So we've got an issue. right? God's presence has come to dwell with them but even Moses himself can't enter in, right? A holy God has come to dwell with the people, but they're not holy. And so what's the solution there? What, what do they need to learn? How to be holy. They need to learn to be holy, yes. right? If God is going to dwell with them as a holy God, then they need to learn to be holy as Yahweh is holy. That's what Leviticus is going to be all about. Leviticus is going to teach them to be holy as Yahweh is holy. And you even see that phrase throughout the book. You shall be holy as I am holy. Right? And just to foreshadow this, look at Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. Then Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Right? Yahweh called to Moses and spoke from the tent of meeting. Right? So you see that Moses is outside, Yahweh is speaking from it. Right? So there's a separation. If you flip to Numbers chapter 1, Whoa. Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. Right? So Leviticus chapter 1, that separation still exists. Numbers chapter 1, Moses has entered the tent of meeting. And so that's the purpose of Leviticus, right? Leviticus is trying to teach the people how to be holy as Yahweh is holy so that they can actually enter into the presence of God. Right? And it's going to work because by the time you get to the beginning of Numbers... Moses is once again communing with God again. Uh, and so that's what we're going to start with next week. Uh, we'll talk about Leviticus, we'll talk about Numbers, and I want to actually spend quite a bit of time in Deuteronomy uh, because Deuteronomy is awesome. We're not going to spend as much time as I would like, but uh, we will cover as much as we can. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. One of y'all want to close out in prayer? All right. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to gather together and go through your word. Um, God, I pray that as we leave this study, um, that the words that we've read and the conversations that we have will also leave with us and we can think about it throughout the week. Um, God, I pray that our hearts can become more like Moses um, and we can have a heart posture that says that we don't want to go anywhere where you won't be before us. Um, God, I pray that we can learn to have faith in you and to trust in you on this side of eternity so that one day our hope can be fulfilled and we can live with you in eternity. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.